no longer a party that's held hostage by the Republican Party who invented these policies. Now we're ascendant and the Democratic Party supports these policies in its own right and is it even possible to have common cause with a party that has these values now? Okay, Chuck. You ask a very tough question. You know, if you don't have a common cause with this party, then the other party ascends into power. But I believe our, that's not the choice. The choice isn't we have to take this crap because if we don't, the Democrats will lose and the others. We have to get on our politicians the way the conservative activists get on theirs and tell them this is unacceptable. We don't accept this. We are going to find Democrats who won't do this to replace you. We have to be in their face about it. I don't want to have the personal relationships with the politicians. I want to be free to go after them when they do things like this. And when you get people ask me, well, why don't you run for the uh, you know, state committee or the Democratic committee? Because when you start palling around with these guys, you get to like them and everything. <laughs> it's really mm -hmm. tough to be in their face. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's tough to talk truth to power. Uh -huh. Not for Darlington, he'll say anything to anybody. Mm -hmm. I know that, I've seen that, you know? But, <laughs> but a lot of people temper what they say and what they you know, do because it's a tough situation to put yourself into. You don't want to be the, the pariah, so I'll be the pariah at Common Sense too, and call them on it. And uh, people will say I'm bashing them. Um, you're, you're absolutely right, we have to go after them to make them change. The alternative is unacceptable. You know, these crazy people are going to come into power, you know? Okay. About a minute. Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't think you can justify these things. Uh, Abraham Lincoln did some of these things. Franklin Roosevelt did some of these things. They were wrong when they did them. You know, and it's wrong when Bush did it. It's wrong if Obama continues to do it. Um, I had someone send me an email, you know, and uh, Lincoln suspended habeas corpus for Confederates. Uh, as you know, Franklin Roosevelt authorized locking up tens of thousands of Japanese Americans because of their race, basically to put them in concentration camps uh, for the duration of the war. Uh, complete denial of their rights uh, as citizens. The, the, uh, I sent something out about Obama or something, and somebody sent me an email like, why couldn't I vote for Obama because, and you know, name the reason. And, uh, and I don't remember which one it was, but you know, my response was, you know, if you're only going to vote for a perfect candidate, you're not going to vote anymore. And a democratic system of government is not going to get better if you don't vote. Uh, I mean, that's not a possibility. So you do have to vote. You have to select who you're going to vote for. I think that was me. I emailed you, and, and okay. you're right. But um, let's, let's uh, okay, sorry. use the process. OK, Chuck, you have 30 seconds. I said what I have to say on the issue, and let somebody else ask a question. No, just that we, I compromise because I have to compromise. I mean, I don't find any good candidates. I mean, I, I was also a member of the Socialist Party for years and tried to form a local socialist group. Couldn't get enough people to form one. Um, so we don't have socialist candidates in our um, Two groups, actually. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's compromise is ugly, but that's how this system works. OK. Any other questions, Pat? Um, I think I've heard you both talk about when something needs to be done, something big, like health care or Social Security. I think probably it was you who quoted FDR saying, make me do it. And Charlie and I heard you talk about that very same quote, make me do it. I've heard politicians today talk about that in terms of single payer health care. I can't do this the way things are right now. You have to make me do this. How do we make them do it if we're unwilling to channel the anger that's out there? The right wing seems very effective at getting that anger, that teabagger anger, which I have to say, sometimes I listen to the teabaggers and I'm agreeing with them because I'm angry too. There has to be a way to channel that anger. How do you, let's make them do it. Well, from the 1930s, uh, I mean, people made Roosevelt do that by occupying factories and refusing to work and refusing to leave until things changed. Uh, we did that in Reagan. And people were arrested in, in mills and stuff in Reagan during the Great Depression. Uh, there was violence. Uh, scabs who tried to take people's jobs and the car windows broken and things like that. Um, the, the civil rights movement 
was as nonviolent, I think, as it could be, but they would put hundreds of thousands of people out there. They'd put people in civil disobedience and get arrested, and some of their tactics included filling up the jails, filling up the prisons. Um, you had the, the sit-down strikes at the Woolworths 5 and 10 cent store, uh, where people every day would come in and be arrested because they couldn't be served because they're African American, and the next day they'd be, their seats would be filled by other African Americans. And until they had thousands of people in jail, the city would go bankrupt trying to pay their, their food bills and stuff. So they had to stop doing that. Uh, and that put pressure on the national government to change the laws. I mean, there's this long process of, of direct action, which we don't see much of today. Um, and people went to jail. Now, those people, in many cases, have nothing to lose, basically. I mean, if you're unemployed in the Great Depression, there's no such thing as unemployment benefits. There's no food stamps. Uh, there were people starving, uh, people committing suicide, entire families. People are starving to death. Uh, we're not that desperate today, which is good, Thank you, but it's also Chuck? part of the issue. Yeah, I think this goes to what you, uh, what you consider a politician to do and uh, how you uh, make them move. Uh, I don't know how much when I have time here, but I'll carry it over to the next time. Um, you know, I agree with Moliere when he said, a politician is someone who pretends to be your servant in order to become your master. Mm -hmm. And seeking redress and grievances from politicians is what I call the inside game. It doesn't work unless you're trying to name a bridge or you're trying to add something little to a bill here and there. If you want major change in this country and significant change, you need only look back to the uh, woman suffrage movement, you know, the civil rights movement. You know, Martin Luther King, if this was Selma in 1963, he didn't come into town and ask the local politicians if it was okay he had a bus boycott. Okay? If you think that the legislature is going to give you significant change, I think it's a misunderstanding of it. They will give you significant change when the cost of doing that change is less, the cost of their, their than, than remaining status quo. They only leave the status quo when they have to, when the court, when their seat is threatened, or when they, okay, or when they feel like, uh, what? Oh, is it? I thought she said two minutes. No, she was doing three, two, oh, one, okay. seven. I'm sorry. No, I think well, you'll get a 30 second. Well, it does, I mean, it does come down ultimately to what are you willing to do? Um, are you willing to run for office yourself? Uh, are you willing to donate money to candidates? Are you willing to break the law and go to jail? Are you willing to use violence? Um, I think that each of us has to decide for ourselves. I have friends who are perfectly willing to get drug and put in jail, so it doesn't mean it. Never been willing to do that. Uh, I thought there was other means to make changes. But we have to sort of decide on, on tactics as individuals. Okay. Thank you. Right. Time is up. Chuck, 30 seconds. Yeah, I, I just wanted to finish the thought on, uh, and I know everybody's getting tired and wants to get out of here, so I'll make this very brief. Uh, change comes when a politician has to change. Because really, why should a politician be against the status quo? That's what put him there. Why does he want to rock the boat? He's sitting in Congress, you're not. His opponents are not. So he's not really for change. They pander like they are, they give you hearings like they are, but they're not for change. They become for change when their position becomes untenable. When all of a sudden their seat is threatened and they might not win. That's when you have the, the need to pressure. 